<laughs> um, so it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our, uh, I would say, guest speaker today, um, um, Marty McHugh. Um, uh, Marty is the regional manager for Sumco Eco Contracting. Uh, it's a company that specializes in uh, natural feature restoration, I will say. You, you'll learn a lot more about it in a minute or so. Uh, but um, I've known Marty for five years or so, personally. Uh, he has a very interesting background. He started within the DEP as a regulator. Is that right? <laughs> so uh, he, his roots are in un understanding the regulatory process. Uh, he then went on to work with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation uh, and now is in private industry. So he, he brings a really unique perspective to these issues uh, from all sides. And so I think we'll learn a lot today about what we're trying to do, how we can do it, and uh, how maybe to overcome some barriers. So, Marty? Well, thank you, Tom, and I really appreciate being here. What a beautiful venue for this, right? Um, I always love coming to Monmouth. Um, my son might come to Monmouth, maybe. Who knows? <laughs> it's in the throes. Uh, that talk by uh, Dr. Adolf stimulated about another hour's worth of my thoughts. <laughs> so I'm going to try, I'm gonna try to distill down to, to you what um, I'd like to talk to you about today. But the first thing I want to say is, uh, I was with the state of New Jersey for 25 years, as Tom said. I wore a lot of different hats there. I was an environmental lawyer there, started out and represented Division of Fish and Wildlife, all the different programs, wastewater, air, the whole thing. And, um, but my, one of my favorite jobs there was, uh, after a stint with NOAA out in the Great Lakes, was, or two jobs, I'll tell you. One was um, I started the Natural Resource Damage Program, which is about taking... Um, uh, settlements from oil spills uh, and uh, and hazardous waste sites that are getting cleaned up and uh, f f trying to figure out what that injury is to fish and wildlife and habitats just like what's going on in these lakes right what's happening to the lakes from the contaminants and and all that and putting a dollar value to it and using that money to restore those resources and we started that in the 90s after the Exxon Bayway spill and it has, it has grown and amassed a, a large amount of money that's funding a lot of restoration projects, which could fund some of the restoration ideas that I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, so that was a real fun job. I mean, how do you put a dollar value to a piping plover or uh, uh, you know, an acre of wetland or whatever? And that's a whole other talk that um, uh, Professor Young out there in the audience has heard me give at his uh, lecture in uh, UPenn. But, um, the other job was uh, working for, uh, as the director of Fish and Wildlife in New Jersey. And the reason why I bring that up is obviously it was really, you know, my background is wildlife ecology and biology. I couldn't do um, organic chem to become a scientist, so I went to law school to do environmental protection instead. So I hand it to all you scientists out there because I couldn't handle the math. But um, one of the things that, uh, as a fish and wildlife director, you know, you're involved with uh, managing all the, the lands and the critters that swim and run and fly over, slither, all that stuff. But we had a huge network of volunteers, citizen scientists, that helped us do our job. And they, they, they were really important. So when I started at uh, Fish and Wildlife, I wasn't going to even talk about this, but listening to all this and what you all doing, I wanted to say it. Um, there was one bald eagle's nest left in the state uh, and that we were managing on the Dividing Creek uh, down in Delaware Bay. And um, we had, a, we, you know, we were managing that nest, taking the eggs out before, uh, and hatching them with hens before the, the adults could, uh, could sit on them and crack them. And from that nest grew, I, you know what, I can't remember. I should know this because I'm on the Conserve Wildlife Foundation board, but it, we're over 200 reproducing nests in the state. But it was much really owed to the, the volunteer network that were watching nests, watching where eagles were, watching what was going on, telling us at DEP and Fish and Wildlife what was happening uh, around those nests. One of them, 
I got involved with uh, protecting because the sand mining company was going to take that nest, this is the original nest, down, and we stopped it because, but we, it was because of volunteers like you. So, and that's just one little thing, right, that our volunteers were involved with. I mean, you, I can't even tell you how many different programs they supported, and we couldn't do our job in the state without volunteers. So, you know, give yourself a round of applause because what you're doing here is really, really important. Um, so really, seriously, uh, and I have total respect for Citizen Scientist Program and thank, you know, thanks to, you know, Urban Coast Institute and Monmouth University for doing this. Um, it's really, really important as the, as the data is showing, right? So, okay, where do I begin here? Because there's so much I want to talk about. Um, so my company, so, you know, I've, I, I've done a number of things after I left uh, DEP after 25 years. Uh, but one of my most favorite things was um, representing National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Previous to that, I represented the Conservation Fund, which got into something called green infrastructure before Sandy. Um, and so I'm going to start out by, where's the clicker on this? Just enter. Okay. I'm going to start out by going backwards a little bit, right, considering it's the 10th anniversary of Sandy, and that was a really important um, event for me and my career in my town, right? My town is the middle town there. That's a, a, a picture of the inlet at Manasquan. I lived in Manasquan, and that was about uh, seven hours before the storm actually hit. That's the inlet. Um, so um, it was a really interesting, obviously surreal experience, and then watching the one in Florida gave me kind of post-traumatic stress, stress disorder. but. Um, but the silver lining in all this is what we learned from all the restoration work that happened after Sandy, all right? And the, I'm going to breeze through these as quickly as I can, but um, this is Manasquan uh, after Sandy. And two weeks after Sandy, because of my work after DEP, uh, working with the Conservation Fund of doing something called green infrastructure or nature-based restoration, uh, the Corps asked, they knew I lived in Manasquan, like, I guess the Army knows where you live, right? And um, they called me up and they, a friend of mine said, would you mind taking some people around from the core uh, to show uh, around Manasquan what could be done from a green infrastructure, nature-based approach to improve resiliency in your town? Uh, because you have all these, it's, it's a microcosm of the coast. You have all these, you have an inlet, you have a coastal lake, which why isn't, why isn't Stockton Lake in the network? Come on, get it in there, right? Um, and, uh, and you have these coastal tributaries, and then you have the tributaries coming down, and you have a lot of development, but you have a remnant natural resources, you have wetlands, you have parks, right? So it was, it was a, a microcosm, and we want you to take them around and, you know, based on what you've been learning from the Conservation Fund about green infrastructure. So I said, sure, fine. And the next day, uh, the, day the morning of, they said, oh, and there, you can meet the um, uh, Lieutenant General Bostic at the Army camp. Seagirt, and he'll be coming in a black, uh, you know, uh, Black Hawk helicopter. I'm like, okay. And I'm like, who's he? Well, he's the commander. And I said, the commander of who? I said, the Army Corps of Engineers. He's in charge of the Army. So I'm like, oh my God, right? So all of a sudden it became more important. That's him. And I took him around the town, and that really kind of started. It wasn't just me, but there were a lot of people like Tom and, and Tony McDonald and everybody, and a lot of people in this, uh, in this university that have been talking about this for many, many years. But now was the time. The silver lining for Sandy was we finally started talking about nature-based restoration, green infrastructure, right? So I'm gonna, So when I took them around, I didn't have any electricity, so I couldn't print out a map of the town. So I had to grab, anybody been to Squan Pizza, Manus, Squan Tavern? Okay, so it's the best pizza in Manasquan, right, maybe around. And so I had to grab a, um, they were giving out pizza to people who were responding to the incident. So I grabbed the placemat from Joe, who's the owner, and I said, I need this because I'm going to meet the commander of the Corps, and I need to show, I need to kind of, you know, locate him while we're walking, which is kind of, at least didn't have pizza stains on it, right? So, you know, I was telling about where the water came in, and there's Stockton Lake, which is not in your network, and then that's the center of town, and then I made sure that he knew where Manasquan Pizza was uh, so that he could, and they went, they actually went, so, um, so that was that. So we didn't really talk, you know, there wasn't a lot of talk about green infrastructure before. Nobody really knew what that meant. Um, people like Tom did, you know, he can give this talk, or John Tiedman, where is John? I don't know if he's still here. But um, they could give this talk, but it really came to light after, 
after, uh, after Sandy, and then when I got involved with the Hurricane Sandy Coastal Grant Program uh, for the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation is when I really started you know, to learn about it. By the way, I, want, I appreciate uh, Dr. Adolph. I am not an environmental engineer. Um, I just maybe talk like one sometimes, right, Bill? But I've been around enough projects to know uh, enough to make me dangerous about what could work, and it's could, all right? So you have to kind of, I like envisioning like projects that improve things. Like it drives my wife crazy when I go into people's homes that were invited and I'm like knocking out walls and I said, well, I would do this and I'm not gonna knock any walls out of here, right? But that's what I like to do when I see, uh, and I'm driving along the road now and I see a stream bank or you know a, a lake or whatever, we could do this, we could fix this, we could, she drives her nuts, you just pay attention to the road. Right? So, um, but I got even more so into this um, with National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, which funded $100 million to try different things. That was the most forward-looking grant program I've, I've ever seen. When I was at Fish and Wildlife, we used to get grants from them for endangered species. But this was like, this was amazing, this grant program, because it really got us a chance to kind of test things out, see what worked, what didn't. And Secretary Jewell, who was the Secretary of Interior, she was way right behind this in the Obama administration. She was amazing. And that's uh, her and uh, Tim Dillingham from the American Littoral Society. And it was over, you know, in all the states uh, that were affected by Sandy. So I got to see projects from Maine to New Hampshire that we uh, gave grants to, and $25 million went to New Jersey. So we learned a lot in New Jersey, but elsewhere that we're, you know, we're bringing into this whole nature-based approach, all right? Um, so you'll hear, and I need you to start looking at green infra, you need, it's like when you go in, when you're thinking about renovating a house, it's exciting, right? Get excited about this. You guys have been collecting all this great data for so many years right now. And it means something, like Dr. Adolf said, right? It's showing something. So like when you're doing your renovation, you get excited about, well, what could I do? Blow out this wall, fix this house, or fix this part of the house, or whatever. Same thing for your lakes. Just start thinking about it, like get excited about it. With all these different opportunities to use these different uh, um, options to improve the water quality and, and the, 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 the public asset, it's, a, it's an asset, right, to your community. And it's an asset, it's a natural asset to protect your built assets, too, in, in the event of a storm, for storm surge, for flood retention, and all of that. But unfortunately, it's the, it's the end of the pipe, right? These, these lakes are the end of the pipe. So they've been suffering for years, and now it's time to do something about it. Now, I've highlighted the last three things there, living shorelines, thin layer deposition, and treatment wetlands, um, interestingly, kind of correlates with what the uh, doctor said this morning, um, and uh, I'm going to focus on those in a minute, all right? But I do want to give kudos, like I was been saying, I've been saying that a lot of this work and a lot of this movement uh, for nature-based and uh, restoration and resilience has been the result of what Monmouth University is doing, all right? So here's Carl's, uh, here's Carl's blog post about you know, a report touting nature-based restoration, right? So Monmouth has been, way be been behind this, um, and this movement has kind of been now uh, embraced by developers. They've gotten together, New Jersey Future, Mazer, all these major um, uh, uh, environmental engineering firms like AKRF and ELP, New Jersey Future is a nonprofit, uh, have put out a guide uh, that ma ma mainstreams green infrastructure approaches uh, for developers. So they, can, they have a guide. I would recommend that you go find this guide. It's on the New Jersey Future website. And it lays out all these different things, the bioswales, the rain gardens, the different approaches that you can use in a development context, like Dr. Adolph was saying. We're developing all these places, right? And we're still developing them. Let's, let's bring in green infrastructure into those. And there's a lot of movement to do that on the part of uh, DEP and, and other regulatory agencies, right? So that's a huge resource for you. Um, of course, you know, you, you've been ramping this up. Your program is ramping this whole movement up to address these issues in the coastal lakes, right? Um, and nonprofits, other nonprofits are glomming on to this for all the work that Monmouth has done and Dr. Adolph and Tom and Tony McDonald have been talking about to deal, and, and I, I'm, a, I'm kind of a, a martial arts guy. If the force is coming at you, use it to your advantage, right? So the force of climate change, the force of algae blooms, the force of all these issues, let's use that force to our advantage and start doing something about this, right? Stop, you know, you've collected all this data, 
right? You have the data, you have the beef, right? Your Arby's, right? You have the beef, where's the beef? You have it, right? You have the data, now it's time to kind of put it into play, right? Let's do something about it. And there are a lot of organizations that are, right? And on top of that, it's a good time to be doing this, right? You should be excited that money is coming down the pike, money has already been put out there to fight algal blooms. $10 million this year, I don't know if DEP has made decisions on the grant applications that have been put in on this. I know Deal Lake put in a grant application. I, I don't have, has anybody heard anything? Not, Not yet? Not right, right. So there's that. Um, uh, and then there's, uh, this was just in the paper uh, yesterday, right? Uh, the uh, people are really getting behind this. They're really starting to see what needs to be done. They're, it's it, the momentum is there. It, it's time to seize this, right? This is a, a volunteer again, Kathleen. Does anybody know Kathleen Mama? That yeah, is that are you Kathleen? Yeah. No. Okay. Well, this is great. This is a great quote because it 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 really talks about you know the the complications that Dr. Adolf was talking about this morning, but also all the folks that are involved in these, you know, in these areas, right? It's not just an agency that can come in and say, you need to do this, right? This is going to be a collaborative approach for these lakes because you're dealing with communities. You're dealing with the fabrics of communities, right? This is, people have grown up around these lakes. They've seen these lakes. They, they, they fish on the lakes. They walk around the lakes. They, uh, they, you know, they kayak on the lakes, right? It's part of their communities. And when they start embracing it like, like is happening here with this organization, Adopt a Drain, which is a small thing, but it's in the aggregate, it's a big thing when folks start, uh, uh, this kind of momentum starts happening with these different organizations. Um, and we'll talk a little further about that. But I gotta say, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I know that you, I appreciate being invited here, but the guy that should be really giving this talk is John. I mean, this is uh, a report from 2009 that I went through before I gave this talk. This is, this is, the, this is the how you do this, all right? This is, is John still here? I told him he should be giving this talk. But this is how you do this. I mean, this really lays it out. And this is from 2009, it was before Sandy. So he was really prescient, and, uh, and, and, and Dr. Witte, and of course Steve Souza, who is retired, but is on the Deal Lake Commission. He was with Princeton Hydro, which is an amazing you know, environmental engineering organization, um, uh, but they really laid this out for everybody, and you should get a hold of this, and you should read this, all right? I'm going to pull a couple of highlights out from this, all right? It's on the Deal Lake Commission website. It is? Yeah. It's on the Deal Lake Commission website, all right? I actually, I knew of the report. I never read it until like three days ago, and I started when I, when I was like, you know, I want to take a look at this report, and then all of a sudden, I changed my, my presentation, right? Um, so the key to sustainable improvement is better, manage of, better management of stormwater runoff, right? Erosional forces, mobilization, and transport of sediments that fill the lake, the amount of nutrient load, all these things that Dr. Adolph was talking, pathogens, right? And, and you're part of the measurable, all right? You've already done the measurements, right? Um, and you're gonna be part of the measuring of how these projects that are gonna get implemented work or don't work, what we're gonna learn from them, right? Uh, and so, and there's two things that you have to do in, to, to restore these lakes in a sustainable way. You have to control the sources, and you have to you have to have come delivery control for the waters coming into these lakes, right? So, and, and you have to deal with existing problems, and then you have to deal with future problems, right? And future problems are going to be more development, hopefully with green infrastructure, but more development and climate change, right? So. Um, we already have, I'm not going to talk about source controls. I'm going to talk about uh, more uh, of, of options in your lakes. Um, but there are source controls out there now. There are, there, there's the MS4 program that the uh, state has put into place for stormwater management in all towns. Uh, each town has an MS4 permit. There's um, the healthy lawns law, all right, that require, you know, that sets up ordinances for managing fertilizers, right? There's, um, uh, the stormwater utilities, all right? There's a bill that was uh, passed by uh, the state to allow for towns to come up with stormwater utilities to, uh, to uh, put fees on impervious surface uh, development and use that money to do some of the work that we're talking about. So 
this is, it, it, you know, the source controls are getting into place, right? But what are the strategies to actually deal with the on in the water, you know, issues that are happening, right? Um, well, you want to, this is what John is writing. I'm just pulling this right out of the report. Con you need controls to reduce or eliminate existing stormwater related impairments, mitigating and preventing future impairments, right? Repairing and restoring, all right? So you're not, so you've got to do two things. So you've got to, you got to stop it from getting worse, and then you got to repair the damage that has happened, right? Uh, and of course, the cost is the issue, right? And with a lot of these lakes, it's going to involve some kind of very costly dredging, which we'll talk about in a minute, all right? Um, but the good news is, like I said, there's funding coming down the pike. Uh, as, uh, as Tom talked about, you know, the Infrastructure Investment Act and, and Jobs Act, that is creating, I can't even figure out how much money there is. There's so many different like funding pots and things and, and, uh, and different uh, uh, approaches for each agency about how they look at the funding pots. Just know that it's biblical how much money is coming down the pipe for that. In fact, I, that's not my term. I was at a meeting with the, both commanders of the District of uh, Philadelphia and New York, Army Corps of Engineers, and they said, they looked out into the audience of contractors and said, the money is biblical, the money coming down, and we don't think there's enough people to actually build these, pro to permit, design, and build these projects. That's what they said. And I raised my hand and said, do you have enough people to manage those, <laughs> to manage that money? And they said, no, we don't. So it's going to be interesting, but it's, it's a unique time for you to be, have your data and ready to go, right? Um, so uh, I have decided, based on the work that I did for the conservation fund, that this is, and, and now my experience working with Sylvan Lake and the Sylvan Lake Commission and the people in town there, that this is really an inherently collaborative process. It's got to be community driven, right, with a wide range of stakeholders. It's got a high, you know, part of the process that you have to go and check out, you know, and understand, which you do, right, um, what, what is the importance of your coastal lake to the town or the towns, right, that are around it, and how they link to provide the benefits to the community. What are those benefits? Uh, to the built assets. What are those benefits? And, and un understand them because you're going to need that to sell, right, these restoration projects. Um, what are the quantity and the current level of service provided to those natural assets? What's the functions right now? What, is, is there fishing there? Is there, is there you know, um, is it, are, the, are there wetlands that are functioning that are cleaning the stormwater? Um, well, with Sylvan Lake, we have a bald eagle that is not the nesting not too far from there. Can, can those bald eagles fish in Sylvan Lake? I don't know right now. I don't know. I, I doubt it, right? Um, is it, are they uh, able to uh, absorb storm flows, uh, excessive storm flows, uh, wave attenuation in, in big storms? Um, and what are the potential projects to maximize those function benefits? What can we do? And let's make this science base, which is a science that you've all collected, right? And then the last thing is, really need to create champions for these projects, right? I'm a contractor. I want to be a champion for all these projects, but I can't. It's got to be a local presence that has to champion this project. So for instance, in Sylvan Lake, which I'm going to talk to you about, we have Ann and Kathleen here from the, from the Sylvan Lake Commission. We have Mayor Ed Bonanno uh, from Avon. We have Al Gubitosi, Mayor Ed, by the way, is another uh, washed up environmental lawyer. I can, you can tell him I said that. <laughs> he and I practiced together at the Attorney General's office. He was on the criminal side, I was the civil side. But he, he understands the, uh, you know, the importance of his lake to his community and the benefits and what it could be, right? So he's a champion. And Ann and Kathleen back there are champions. You need to develop those local champions for the projects that you want to accomplish, right? This is kind of like not rocket science, right? Um, so let's talk about Sylvan Lake real quick, all right? Uh, which uh, is, uh, it's, it could be a model for, because we're, 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 we're not far along, but we're pretty, you know, we're in a process right now to come up with a restoration strategy. And the reason why, the, the, the way it began is, um, my company got, a, uh, got selected to do a living shoreline, a small living shoreline on that part of the lake. All right? And this is how we envisioned the project, the larger project. We, we started working on this, on this living shoreline. Um, 
So this is, you know, we're talking about uh, historic photos, right? So on the left there is um, a postcard from what Sylvan Lake used to look like, and, and there's the Cashel Mara right there at the east end of the lake, right, in Avon. And, um, and then to the right is what it looked like before we started the living shoreline, part of the living shoreline. Uh, and then Matrix New World was the engineer in this, and they're a very good engineering firm if you get a chance to work with them on some of these projects. But yeah, how far back do you go, as, as Dr. Adolf said? Well, we're trying to do something similar to what was there, um, and, and the importance of that for water quality is obvious now, because those, those, those lakes that have more wetlands, right, have better water quality. Uh, there's a correlation there that we heard this morning. So this was um, this was uh, during early part phases of the of the construction. Uh, and you can uh, and you know the top left there. There's Mayor Ed in the middle. I think I don't know. Is that somebody from the uh, commission? Is that one of you guys out there? Is that Ann? I don't remember. But again, it just shows, um, you know, our, our guys that were there, but this is a collaboration. Before we really jumped off on this, we wanted to make sure everybody was on board and everybody knew what was going to happen. Um, and, um, and we, start, we, you know, we got it going. But this, remember, this is just a small piece of it, right? So uh, this is during construction. Uh, we're starting to create bioswales um, at the end of street ends where there's uh, storm drains coming in. And you can, you can find these places along your lakes to do the same thing. Rock swales that slow down the water, reduce velocity, and train sediment, uh, cull out the, uh, the contaminants, right? Um, and then instead of all that cobble and, and eroded shoreline that was there, we, we sloped the shoreline and we started putting in matting to, um, uh, core, core matting uh, made out of coconut fiber, right, to, uh, to stabilize the shoreline and then begin our planting process. So this is what the swales looked like after we built them. There's the, the core, uh, core matting going in and the core logs out in the water to kind of protect with the sill fence the plants that were being put in. And Bill Young out here, who is our wetlands, professional wetlands biologist, uh, directed all this planting. Um, so this is what it looked like on the left and then through the into the first fall and it was amazing how quickly the plants took and the dramatic, the dramatic change in the shoreline there. While we were planting this, the turtles and the fish were trying to get into the area where we were, we weren't even putting, the, the plants were going in. I mean there was like, it was, uh, it was, you know, on the left here, they were trying to get over the over the silt fence. The birds were coming in. Uh, it was amazing. I've never seen any. If you build it, they will come, right? Um, and so we uh, this this is the after, this is the first spring, all right. And the day that I went out to take these pictures, I was swarmed by pollinators, damselflies, dragonflies, butterflies, bees, right? There were birds all over the place. Um, and I had never seen anything. And then, so Bill and I started talking about this and with, with the mayor, and we kind of started to think about, well, if we could do this here, why can't we do the whole lake? Why, why don't we restore this whole lake? I mean, this is obvious that this is improving the quality of this lake, right? Um, and by the way, the, um, the residents were kind of skeptical at first. They, most of them really like it, right? One of them happens to be my cousin, which I didn't know he was. Um, but, uh, and I heard from them, and, and they really like the way it looks, right, and what it's doing for their community. Can Bill, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, did you get any resistance from homeowners that live across from the lake? Oh, yeah. Because of their view? Yeah. Yeah, they, uh, they were concerned about their view, just like people are concerned about their view on the beach. You know, I, want, I don't want to see, you know, I, want, I don't want a dune because I want to see the beach, right? But. Once they saw what this looked like versus what it was and what was happening in front of their homes in terms of uh, the natural resource values and the functions that were, uh, that were improving, they, I'd say almost 100% were very uh, you know, supportive of this, right? Bill, I, I can't uh, identify the two plants uh, pictures on the left. You took those. Um, do you know what they are? I could, there's one SAV at the top and the, and the yellow flower at the bottom and the growing in the rock swale. I don't know, but it's, you know, it was amazing. 
Yeah, okay, all right, yeah, it could be. So this is what it looks like now, all right? And, um, and it's clear that the, I would love to see the data from where the sampling points are, whoever's, is somebody here t doing sampling for, yeah. So what do you think? I mean, are you seeing a difference? Um, You're not seeing a difference there? Oh. Closer to, uh, okay. All right. Well, I'll get to that real quick. But um, so here's a picture of I, I, I'm, I'm not kidding you. Every time I go there, the birds are there. Sometimes we don't want too many birds, but there's less birds in the areas where there's a natural shoreline because they are on, you know, the geese and the brant don't like the, the, you know, the large growth on the area. So they, they tend to not come in to those areas when, when, they're, when they're planted like that, uh, which is a benefit to the lake. But the use of this area is, is amazing, and it's, it's really turned out to be beautiful. So we envisioned this project because of that, all right? We started talking about, well, what could we do? Well, we have major sediment here uh, coming into the lake, and at the left end there, the west end, is where all the water comes in through this four bay. So I started going around the lake and looking at it, and taking pictures, and this is what it looks like. Um, uh, and the four bay uh, is up in the right there by that concrete wall, and then you see it in the middle, um, right under the Route 71, and it's kind of a mess, all right? Um, and uh, it's also an attractive nuisance. I mean, if a kid f would fall in that, it could be really bad, right? And there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of area, you know, freeboard there. Um, but the what I really saw, I was hoping that I would get to. Uh, show you, oh, it didn't come up, but uh, there's a lot of dog walking and geese use, especially on the Bradley side, and a lot of uh, uh, turbidity and SAV that, you know, it looks like invasive, um, and, and it's washing into, you know, all that material is washing into the lake and causing problems. So when the, when the repairs to the uh, flume were made, they drew down the lake, and then you really got a chance to see what was going on and where the sediment was. It was dramatic, right? And, um, I, oh, there it is. So the, those are big issues, right? The, the, the waterfowl and dog walking, people who don't pick up their material. So the side, the Avon side is a natural, more natural side. The Bradley side is a stone wall and then a broken down old bulkhead and then a, 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 an older living shoreline toward the east end. And you'll see pictures of that. Here's a sediment, you know, pictures. This is the, on the left there, this is the, um, the uh, bulkhead and then the stone wall on the right. And then you see all these outfalls that could be bioswales if you pulled them back, all right? So um, at the same time we were doing this, and I was thinking about this, we're doing a, a project up in uh, North Jersey um, to restore a 63-acre lake. And they didn't, they, they didn't want to uh, take the dredge out because it was too expensive, right? So what we came up with was, let's keep the dredge material in the system. We'll dredge the areas of the lake that have invasive weed growth instead of spraying the lake, uh, which the, the spray material goes down into a stream that I just restored for trout, which I didn't want to see happen, right? So we're gonna, so we propose to take that dredge material and create wetland benches along this lake called Bear Pond up in Sussex County. So we're gonna keep the material in the system and create these wetland benches so that the water that's flowing into the lake will flow through these wetlands and the wetlands will, you know, uh, clean, right, phytoremediate the, the, uh, the um, surface water uh, uh, sheet flows, right, and also will provide habitat, nursery habitat for fisheries and birds and all, you know, habitat for birds and bats and all that and, and pollinators. Uh, and so we started to do this, and it's actually a, a permit that's underway, and then that gave us the vision for what we plan to do for Sylvan Lake. Now, it was just not my plan, all right? We, we went to multiple meetings of the Sylvan Lake Commission. Uh, Anne was there, Kathleen was there, others. We talked, we changed things. We, you know, this is a collaboration. This is, it's something that has to be embraced by your communities and put forward by your communities. It can't be something that a contractor like me would like to see done or uh, a nonprofit or the agency even itself. It has to be embraced by the community. A lot of socialization, like I like to say, has to go into this, right? 
all you have to get around the table and you have to really think about it and talk about it and hear complaints and and you know it, it takes time it takes a lot of time but it's also through the process the champions get created all right people kind of get get on board get feel empowered to put their input in and are empowered and they can take this ball and move it forward so you need to come up with your vision whether it's for the entire lake or for a part of the lake and create a straw man and then start to socialize that so that's what we did here at Sylvan Lake um, oops uh, so what we're proposing is we're proposing to dredge the lake all right, and we're not in we're we're not in design yet. We have about a 10 per, 20 percent design. We're proposing to dredge the lake, use the dredge material to create wetland benches in those areas uh, on Bradley's side in front of the bulkhead. You might not even have to take out the old bulkhead. You might be save, able to save all that money, all right? And and create wetland benches that will be planted. Uh, the material stays in the lake. You don't have to take it out, all right? Uh, you won't have to incur that expense. And then use this material also on the living shoreline on the Avon side. And then on the western end where um, that four bay is and we have all that freeboard, that's where you can lose a lot of material. When I say lose or use a lot of material and create a treatment wetlands, a whole treatment wetlands in that area that we have highlighted there. All right. Now, we propose this. We didn't just do this willy-nilly, of course, after talking with Sylvan Lake and the mayors and the, uh, you know, the, uh, and, uh, and the councilmen from Bradley Beach and all that. We went to DEP and did two pre-application meetings with them to get their input. Like, is this doable? Is this something you would like to see? And they're like, we want you to beneficially use these sediments. We want you to try it. We want you to be a model. So we got input on it from them, and they said, we really like it, but we would like to see you do pre-treatment. So pre-treatment... Uh, would be to the left there on the uh, public works property where the water comes in through this really messed up um, four bay here. Uh, and this would be the area where the treatment wetlands would be, right? Um, where we would lose, uh, use that material. So this is what, it, you know, this is kind of the area right now, 10% design, where there would be treatment wetlands with swales coming out from all those pipelines, right? Treating that water slowing it down, dropping out sediment. Uh, they proposed a pocket park there um, because it'll be, the elevations will be changed. And then this pretreatment area is a total mess. It's full of invasive Japanese knotweed and other invasive species, and there's busted pipes in there and everything. It's a perfect place for what we call a manufactured treatment device, um, which I think I have a picture of in here. And this is that area, if you could see it, how badly it is. So it's a perfect place to put this manufactured treatment device into place. And this is from uh, you know, uh, John Tiedemann's report. Um, these are manufactured treatment devices. And what, what the water flows through there, and you can pull out all the floatables and the large pieces of whatever comes into the lake. And it also entrains um, uh, you know, sediment as well and can be cleaned out very easily and it's easy to maintain. And that would be a perfect place for that. So that's what we came up with based on DEP's recommendation. And we, you know, this, this approach for wetland benches has, it, this is not new. This is being used on coastal resilience projects up and down the coast now. Um, and FEMA is even behind a lot, you know, funding a lot of these a lot of these projects. So this is something that would really be beneficial to your lakes in different places to increase the wetland, um, uh, you know, the amount of wetlands in your area uh, to treat the water. So this is the, this is the rock wall that will uh, potentially have, uh, you know, uh, the uh, wetland benches and we're trying to, we're still engineering how those would be held up, whether they be with geotubes or rock sills. You already have a sill there that we could build on um, and, and leave the top of the wall so that you can see the wall. And then plant the grass areas with uh, with native plants, and this is in front of the failing bulkhead, right? And this is what this is what they look like uh, from an engineering point standpoint, with uh, geotubes. Geotubes are big dirt bags, and they sequester, they hold the dirt, and they keep it in. And if there's contaminated material in the, the you can add in biochar and soil amendments, and it can keep it can bind up those contaminated materials and keep them from being exposed. Um, and that, that's, a, what's, that's what you see on the bottom there. A wetland bench is basically, uh, it, well, here's a picture right here. You can see um, uh, this like uh, geotube or sock, they call it socks, right? Uh, will hold the, uh, 
will hold the material from the dredged areas, and then you can plant wetlands along the side, basically interior living shorelines to the lake, all right? It's, it's another term for that, all right? It's like the shoreline that we did in front of the Cachemara, but it's actually using more sediment. All right? So it's a place to put sediment. Now, here's the downside of this, all right? There's downside to everything. There's a you know, give and take on everything, right? A balance. So the lake is going to lose surface area if we do this. The lake is going to lose surface area. There's no doubt, right? Now, on a smaller lake like Sylvan, you know, it's, it's something to think about. On a larger lake like the 63-acre lake, it really is you know, not going to have that much of an impact. But you're going to have a deeper lake that's going to have better turnover, better habitat, better water quality treatment, um, better usage, and we're going to create uh, points for access for fishing, kayaking, and just observation of wildlife which are going to come, right? Um, so, you know, we involved uh, Kane University at the time uh, when we started early on envisioning this, and we want to involve, uh, you know, Monmouth University, Kane University, the high schools, just like Tony was saying before, uh, Tony McDonald. This is a huge opportunity to do some you know, some in-community education right in your backyard, right? Uh, and get the students involved. And, they, and the Kane University students did some sampling for a sediment sampling, which is obviously, uh, you know, would have to be done to do this. And they mapped the watershed as well. But now we have partners, American Littoral Society coming in with us, um, and they've been actually there from the, from the beginning. And Monmouth has jumped in, and we, we actually got a uh, grant, right, uh, Tom? to do the design and the permitting for this project. Um, and we're hoping to do it in a design build way where we can, you know, the builders like my company can have input into the process so that we build something that's, you know, we, we design something that's buildable, right? That's not something that's like a ni just a nice design. And the Sylvan Lake Commission and Avon and Bradley Beach are, uh, uh, you know, are part of the process, obviously, and they've written letters of support for the grant, and that's one, one of the reasons why we got the grant. So, so that's the in-lake, right, type of approach, but then for Deal Lake, there's a lot of, in, it's a much larger lake, a lot of issues. I'm, I, I'm trying to try to wrap up here, but I'm going to go through this quickly. So Deal Lake, um, we decided uh, to start in the upper part of the watershed. Because remember, this report talks about uh, not just in-lake work, but you've got to look at your tributaries, what's happening up in your tributaries, right? So um, Laura McBride and I connected, and I won't tell you how. <laughs> it's kind of a strange um, thing through my doctor. <laughs> um, I was having a medical procedure, and her doctor is, uh, is uh, uh, excuse me, my doctor's on her board. And um, I was coming out of the surgery, and she was asking me what I was doing. Uh, what I did for my work, and I said, well, I do this lake restoration, and blah, blah, blah. she goes, like, oh, I'm on Silver Lake, I mean, I'm on Deal Lake, and uh, you got to help us, and da, 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 and that's how I met Laura, so I told my boss, that even when I'm in the doctor's office or coming out of surgery, I'm, I'm talking about this stuff, but, so I, I thankfully met Laura through that process, through that, and, uh, and, excuse me, and she told me, I, you know, it's weird, I had never been to Deal Lake uh, and throughout my 25 years as Director of Fish and Wildlife, excuse me, at DEP, and then as Director of Fish and Wildlife, and I, you know, I've been around Deal Lake. I mean, I didn't realize how um, complicated Deal Lake is and how large it is, um, and the issues there are profound, obviously, right? Who's here from Deal Lake, right? So you got a really tiger by the tail there, right? There's a lot happening in that watershed, but... The upper part of the watershed is, in my opinion, is where you got to really focus first. Because um, if you don't focus there, whatever you're going to do in Deal Lake, it's not like Sylvan Lake, um, you're probably going to be not getting the best bang for your dollar if you're going to work in Lake first, all right? So um, that's what I told Laura after looking at this. And then I was going to... Costco or Target or something like that on a, on a rainy day, and I'm going, you know, through the, the, the mall up there at the uh, Seaview Square Mall, I guess it's called, right? And, um, and I, I, I'm like, this is the tributary to Deal Lake that I was looking at, so I stopped, and I looked in that um, stream that runs past the county building, you know, right behind the bagel place and all that, and I was amazed about the, the water and the, and the sediment and the invasive species and all that. And I said, 
bingo, this is it. This is where we got to be. All right. This is the first place you got to look in the, you know, in this to do a demonstration project to show people, to show the state, to show these communities how to do this. Right. So, um, this is obviously, uh, you know, a, a high view of Deal Lake. There's Sea View Square Mall. Right. There's where I'm talking about. And um, actually, uh, I, that smaller circle is, I forget the neighborhood name, but that's where Laura lives. Colonial Terrace, Colonial Terrace thank you. And the, when I met her and we went out to Seaview, I actually, she showed me, you know, what's happening in Deal Lake, and it, it was totally, what I saw was corroborated by what's happening in her, basically, her backyard. Um, there's so much sediment, the, the water is so murky. Uh, I don't know how you see, like, six inches into that, this lake. Uh, and the shorelines are eroded, and the, uh, the um, invasive species uh, along the shorelines, trees falling in, so losing canopy. I mean, it's just amazing what's happening at the lake in that neighborhood. I'm sure it's elsewhere, right? And you can even see the sediment, uh, you know, just from, just from the, uh, this aerial, this Google view, right? I mean, it's pretty amazing what's going on into this lake. But it's coming in from the tributaries, right? So this is the golf course that you can see across. Um, and you can see that big bar in the middle there. That's sediment loading right there. I mean, I could get in there and take that sediment and create a living shoreline right in the foreground of that picture, right, and plant it. Uh, and that's the kind of stuff that you got to think about. And as soon as I saw that, I'm like, that's what we, or put it on the golf course and extend the hole and make it a, you know, make it a living shoreline, you know, whatever hole that is, nine, right? What a, what a, what an asset that would be to the golf course, right? And this, this sediment is a resource. It's not a waste. This is, this is a resource. We've got to use, we've got to stop thinking about it as a waste. It's a resource. So this is, but this is where we're going to focus, all right? Um, this is that area, that stream that was honking when I saw it that first time. Uh, and uh, well, look, at, look at what's draining there, right? Why is it a problem? Obviously, it's, it's pretty clear, right? Um, so here's a closer in picture. Uh, I only have a few more slides. This is what we're seeing here. This is the culvert coming in, right? This is not during, I have, you know what? I should have brought the pictures. Um, I have pictures of it while it, when it was, really high. Uh, so this is all the invasive knotweed here, all right? This is that culvert. You can't even see the culvert. It's all, it's all grown in and it's, it's not functioning well. Um, it's a straight shot, right? So it doesn't meander like the ones that we created for Sylvan Lake. So it's not slowing down anything. It's not entraining anything, right? There's no plants in the rocks to, like we did at Sylvan Lake, right? Uh, this is uh, basically the floodplain that is no longer connected, just full of knotweed and other invasive species, right? This is this is the um, this is not this is not even a, a high flow, and you can see how muddy the water is and the eroded banks, right? This is all going into your lake at Deal Lake, right? Look at that, and that's see the sediment on the shoreline on the right hand side. That's where it's building up, and then a high flow, poosh. That goes all the way under Route 35 and out to, out to the lake, into Laura's backyard, and then into the lake, right? So um, these are more close-up pictures. This is the other side of the, of the stream, right? Which is interesting. If you see in the top picture there um, with that stone, there are two vaults, right? And I just went out there during a rainstorm, and those vaults were open. They dropped down 14 feet. Anybody could fall into those. So don't go there you know, in the dark, please. Because it's, and it's really dangerous. It's an it's a attractive nuisance, but they're not functioning at all. And it's a straight shot. I mean, we could pull that back and create a meander, slow down the water, put in a manufactured treatment device, a real one. So there's, a, and then there's these woods over here on the other side that could be incorporated into a larger project for a park, all right? A walking path and a park, which we are designing with uh, Melillo Bauer, um, who, uh, West, West Masco is um, a member of the Deal Lake uh, Watershed Alliance that Laura McBride uh, is the executive director of. I'm sorry, I should have said that. And, um, and Wes is, is designing, as a landscape architect, and he's designing a, uh, a park for this, as well as uh, renderings for what we're intending to do. So those are the kinds of things that you can do up watershed, all right? And those are the kind, and, and, and in a lake like Deal Lake, depending on your lake, um, Sylvan Lake is, 
I, you know, Sylvan Lake is, is a lake that can benefit immediately from in-lake work, all right? And we saw what happened uh, with, with that just small project that we did, a living shoreline. But a lake like Deal Lake and some of these other lakes, you're going to have to go up watershed to start envisioning these projects. But it's going to take a lot of footwork. But you all have the data. The data that you have can be used to make the arguments about, about getting to some demonstration projects to get the momentum rolling. And with the um, amount of money that's coming down the pike, now's the time, right? Uh, so um, I'm going to be around. Bill Young's here. Bob Kellner, who is also here. Where is Bob? Right? He has a lot of experience in this. I'm working with him on another project. Pick our brains, you know. Um, pick the brain of John Tiedman. Oh my goodness, you have this resource here. Tom Harrington, right? Dr. Adolf. I mean, you know, we can think of a number of different kinds of projects. You just have to kind of do it and sell it, but use your data to, you know, to, to, to base it on, right? It's got to be based on data, as, as, as everyone has said before me. So it can be done. And, and, and we can make big improvements, and we can have that sustainable management that uh, John is talking about. Uh, that's a, th this is a great report. I, I urge you to read this. And then there's another book out there called Green Infrastructure that kind of started the movement. And uh, these are folks from the Conservation Fund that wrote this book. It's, uh, Bill Young is using it for his class, right, to teach in uh, ecological restoration. Highly recommend looking at this. And then go to the website for the, uh, the, the builder's um, uh, green infrastructure guide. Uh, there's so much resources out there. It's, it's really, it's time. You, you know, you have the data, right? Uh, and um, I think I've w I'm, I'm way over my time, but uh, Mark Bennett, Benedict, I'm sorry, and Ed McMahon. Unfortunately, Mark has passed away. He was a, a great resource. Um, God bless him. So, yes. Right. How was that paid for? Well, it's not paid for yet, all right? So it took three years, about, from, from the time we envisioned, right, Kathleen and Ann, to getting a grant application, thankfully with Tom's help, that was uh, to the Department of Defense through a program called REPI. Don't ask me to tell you what that name, uh, uh, what that acronym is, but it's for resilience around bases, right? And the Department of Defense is willing to fund uh, the design and the uh, and the permitting for that project, but see once you get that seed money, it creates momentum. Money attracts money, so they want to see commitment. They want to see investment, right? To get to get to the next level. So this infrastructure money that's coming down the pike is going to be doled out through the state, through the federal agencies, Department of Defense, Department of Interior, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA, all right, and maybe even FEMA. And then if you have a shovel-ready project um, or a planning project that you would like to fund for your lake, start writing, start sketching it out, all right? Start putting together that straw man proposal that we did for Sylvan Lake and the one that we're doing for Deal Lake for the upper part of the watershed. And so what's paying for that part of the project? What's paying for? for the planning. The planning is going to be, for so for Sylvan Lake, it's a Department of Defense grant. Well, Repi. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, who got the money? So, yeah. So, um, uh, in that, uh, Monmouth University partnered with the American Littoral Society, and who else? Who else? Who's the recipient of the grant? The money comes into Monmouth. To Monmouth. It comes into Monmouth University. So Tom is going to be the guy that's going to do all your projects. <laughs> No, he no, can't. But, you know, partners like American Littoral Society, um, you, uh, that's right, you're Deal Lake, right? Westley Lake. Westley. Oh, you're Wesley Lake? I'm Sunset. You're Sunset Lake? Who's Deal Lake? Okay, so Deal Lake is going to be uh, the Deal Lake Watershed Alliance or the Deal Lake Commission, right? Uh, and if you were lucky enough to have a commission, a, a lake commission like Deal Lake or Sylvan Lake, those are the folks that you know that could be 
the uh, the grant applicant for these different projects. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. When you have a lake that has a lot of private property, right on the lake, yeah, right. So uh, that was a, that's an issue for us up in Sussex County. So two thirds of the lake is owned by one landowner, very wealthy philanthropist. The rest is owned by people around the lake. So we're focused on the side that he owns. But once we started to plan it, people wanted to get on board. Um, so it, it takes a little more selling, right, uh, about the project and a little more effort to socialize the project. But no, that's, that creates definitely a, um, another hurdle, shall we say, that's not insurmountable. But, you know, with the public education that's been going on now in your coastal lakes, like uh, Kathleen uh, from Asbury Park and, and the momentum that's being built, I think you'll find that... Um, you're going to get more cooperation from these lakes. So Deal Lake, there's it's like all private landowners, right? Um, and uh, you got to, you know, there's there's a study that was done by Green Acres, uh, the Green Acres program in New Jersey. When you have healthy resources in your backyard, literally, right? But in your in your community, right? If you're living across from a park or you have a restored um, a restored area in you know forest or field in your community it increases the value of your homes by 30%. I'm not, it's not, I'm not just making that up. This is data, right? And that's out there. So that's one of, that's one of the arguments that you have to use, right? Good, oh, okay, good question. Yeah, so when you're, when you're thinking about these projects, like, like the Deal Lake project that I'm talking about, they're gonna, they're going to be interested in funding that because we're going to we're including a public access, right? Uh, it, we're including a public access amenity there. That's why I got Wes involved because I thought we could put trails in here, and it could be a, a park, not just a parking lot, right? Um, and then uh, for, below deal below that project at Wikipeco, right? There's a little pocket park. That's going to be also another public access point. So and then for Sylvan Lake, we're going to include public access car top. Um, excuse me, kayak, uh, fishing platforms, all that. So yes, you got to build in public access to your to your projects if you can, and that makes them more attractive for you know for grant funding, um, and uh, you know more support for them as well, especially in disadvantaged communities like Asbury Park. Um, you know that's a whole other you know opportunity there to kind of get people out to the resource. The more people you get out to the resource, I was director of Fish and Wildlife. I want more people out there, so that they become they become supporters of conservation. When you, when, on these resilience projects, when we started doing these NIFWF resilience projects, which is what really jazzed me, so when I was director of Fish and Wildlife, we had the paddlers, the fishermen, the hunters, the, the, uh, the hikers, you know, supporting conservation, right? But John Q. Citizen, you know, that had a wetlands in their backyard, um, maybe, right? How do I get those citizens, right? Uh, or J Jane and John, right? How do I get them? Well, when they started seeing their, uh, with these resiliency grants, seeing the protection that those wetlands were giving after they were restored to the shorelines or, or the streams or the tributaries, they became supporters of conservation. So for me, it's kind of a personal agenda. You could build support by getting people out there, getting to see what the functions and values of those, of those uh, natural resources are for their community and for their own property, right? Uh, and it, it just creates momentum. So, uh, any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Yes, they are. And in fact, uh, you know, I, I've, I glossed over a lot of work, but we met with, we met with them twice, right? And the county, Tom Arnone and uh, other folks from the, from the uh, county commission. So there was a lot of, of uh, background in that already, like a lot of socialization, a lot of discussion about that project. I wonder if you could comment, there's a bill before the state legislature to take the stormwater management, management away from the EPA and give it to the economic development part, which the development is developers. Uh, 
I have not heard about that. I mean, my head's been down in all these projects, so I don't really, I'm not paying attention a little bit to the, to the state politics at this point. Yeah, I don't really know a lot about that. Um, yeah, I don't think it, I, I find it hard to believe that something like that would pass. Uh, uh, that's really gonna buck the system, so to speak. I can, if part of me understands uh, why they would wanna try that. There's a lot, you know, a lot of these regulatory programs are based on old data, right, and old, uh, we, Tom and I were just talking about, you know, the timing restrictions that, you know, prevent my firm from dredging in certain times of the year, right? They're based on data that taken when I started at DEP in 1985. You know, that's old data. So, uh, so it's frustrating for the, you know, for the development community and the economic side of things to have projects held up by things like that, all right? Um, so it's got to be addressed, right? So those kinds of issues have to be addressed. And then if you don't address them, then you get something like what you're talking about, which is maybe not productive either, so. Um. Another group in the state, Thailand's Commission. Thailand's, yeah. Uh, Thailand's Bureau, yeah. They are, they're stopping us, basically, because they want money every dread that Thailand is Really, which, is this for Rec Pond? Right, right, Black Creek. Uh, yeah, that that's, um, I'm not surprised, right? Uh, I've dealt a lot with the Thailand's, uh, re, you know, the Thailand's folks, and, uh, but you can work, that can be worked through. I think you just need the right people to go before the Thailand's and make the argument. In fact, you should be aware that, so I, I looked at a project in Seagirt with uh, the Seagirt Conservancy. They were doing that small park there, and I said, you know, if you're going to do this, why don't you do the whole lake, right? I have a lot of experience with Rec Pond. We tried to give them a grant for um, a living shoreline on the Spring Lake side, and nobody wanted it because they wanted to see that grass with all the dog poop and the uh, the uh, geese poop and all that, right? And the the the, the unnatural shoreline. So they didn't want the nat they didn't want the the living shoreline like we did in front of Kashmara. I think that I think that. I think the time is ripe to kind of revisit that, but we're, so this park that we looked at is now evolving into a much larger, potentially, full restoration for, for Rec Pond. It's just, we're just starting to talk about it. So um, it got derailed by that whole thing at Crescent Park, but I think it's gonna start, gonna start talking about it again. And Black Creek, you gotta look at Black Creek, right? So that's a big lake. There's a lot happening in that in, 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 the, in the lake, right? It's been dredged once by the flume. The flume's been fixed. And there's a lot of data that uh, ALS, I'm gonna get it for you, uh, has been taking for years. But my opinion, you wanna start up watershed there. So you got to look into their MS4 permit, right? So they have permit requirements under the MS4 program that they should be adhering to, and that might be one way to get at that, right? And we can talk further about it. And I went way over. I'm sorry, Carl. Yeah, I'm seeing that, unfortunately, in Manasquan, too. They're just built right next to a stream that floods all the time. Um, and just, I, like, I couldn't believe it uh, that they even got the permits for it, but um, flooded during Sandy. So I don't know. There's, there's that happening right now, too, yeah. So from polluters, from oil spills and hazardous waste sites that were cleanups. Yeah, that's from the White Lake cleaners. Right. Swan and White White too. So I think it's I think that one unfortunately is an orphan site. So that's why Superfund the fund, that's what it was established for was to really fund the cleanups of sites 
that have no owners, right? That they went defunct or, you know, they're, they're no longer in business. And so there's, you could probably um, uh, make a, try to make a recovery against Superfund for, for natural resource damages, but there's so many out there, it would be uh, unlikely that would happen. Um, so, yeah, but I don't know if they bought the liability. They might, they probably didn't buy the liability if they were smart, so. <laughs> Most banks are pretty smart, so um, yeah, it's unfortunate. But there's, I don't know how close to 800 million dollars. I don't know what the number is now, but that, that the state has for impacts to groundwater injury, groundwater, right? Application could be made to the state office of natural resource restoration, which used to be office of natural resource damage, which I started, to you know, to do the, you know, some amount of restoration in Rec Pond, considering that it's been impacted by that Superfund site. That is, there's no, there's no reason why they wouldn't look at that, right? That would be a huge potential. I'm sorry? Uh, I don't, you know what, I, I don't know, all right? Um, I'd, I'd have to look into it, but I don't, I don't know. Sorry I went over, guys. Tom knows I always do, so. <laughs> well, I hope that stimulated a bunch of ideas. Because that's what you need. Good work, everybody. Uh, thanks, Marty. Um, a lot to think about, and we scheduled the lunch that we have now. Lunch is available outside to include um, opportunities to talk about things with the experts who are here, uh, including Marty and his colleagues. Um, I also want to introduce some students that are here uh, who are responsible for the posters over here. Um, Marie Morrow is a uh, third year student at Monmouth. You have to stand up so people. Um, Marie did a project this summer with me looking specifically at Deal Lake and what comes out of Deal Lake on the ocean side. Um, we happened to have done that project during a really severe drought. So our results kind of reflect that. But um, if you want to check out Marie's poster and, and talk to her about it, there she is right there. <laughs> And Brooke Van de Sand in the back there um, is in the middle of a project right now looking at um, uh, fecal indicator bacteria in Deal and Sunset Lakes and um, looking at the hypothesis that rainfall drives um, that pollutant in those, those lakes. And then Christine is not here. Um, if Christine shows up, I'll introduce her as well. But in the meantime, in, enjoy lunch and um, let's continue the conversation. <laughs>